day in the life of a Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 has been a computer that I've always wanted to own for several reasons ever since I started collecting vintage computers a couple of years ago. For one, it has a lot of historical significance being one of the defining home computers of the 8-bit era. I've also always loved the adorable and iconic form factor of the original breadbin Commodore 64s just being a little brownish gray keyboard. Not to mention the fact that a lot of vintage computer YouTubers such as the 8-Bit Guy and LGR who got me into collecting vintage computers in the first place have nothing but praise for the original Commodore 64. But most importantly I always wanted to utilize the SID chip of a Commodore 64 and use it as sort of a classic synthesizer for music projects. But despite all these reasons I always put off buying a Commodore 64 for some reason and instead fixated on vintage Apple equipment as old Apple computers and Macintoshes are what I grew up with, and I always liked the industrial design of these computers. However, I recently started to notice that Commodore 64s are starting to skyrocket in price. So rather than wait any longer to buy one and risk having them exceed my price range, I instead decided to finally pick one up. I ended up paying a lot more than I'm normally comfortable with when buying vintage computers, and for a Commodore 64 that was in very rough cosmetic shape. It had its fair share of scuffs and scratches and was overall covered in a fine layer of dust and dirt. It almost looks as though it had been sitting out in the open in either a garage or an attic for decades. But on the bright side, it does come with this cool aftermarket keyboard cover. Now the seller had said that they had tested the computer to boot, but all that tells me is that they turned on the computer and got some sort of image. Whether or not it's the correct image, we will soon find out. But before I deal with testing the functionality of this computer, I first want to restore it cosmetically. And first things first, I start by removing the aftermarket market keyboard cover and setting it aside. Thankfully there were no adhesives holding it on and was only held on by friction alone. Then I start the disassembly process by flipping the computer over and removing the three Phillips head screws on the bottom of the machine. Next I carefully lift up the top of the machine and then I use my screwdriver to keep it propped up like so while I disconnect some wires. The first cable being this keyboard connector right here. Next being this little cable here that connects to the little red power indicator light on the top of the case. And with those two cables disconnected, I can now pull away the top case from the bottom case. Next, I use a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the keyboard assembly from the top case like so. Next, I'm going to move to giving the top case a good cleaning with some isopropyl alcohol. After a good half an hour of scrubbing with alcohol, I would say most of the dirt, dust, and scratches were gone from the top case of the Commodore 64. So next it was time to move on to cleaning the bottom case of the computer, but first that means I have to remove the whole logic board assembly from it. But to expose all the screws I would need to remove the logic board, I would first have to pull back this cheap RF shield that looks like it's made out of cardboard. So to do this, I just pull off this metallic tape and I fold the whole thing back exposing the motherboard. 
Then it's just a matter of removing the screws holding the logic board down. Now unfortunately these little posts for the logic board screws are notorious for breaking on these older Commodore 64s and in my case I lost two. This is something that I'm going to have to fix later on but in the meantime I'm going to move on with cleaning the bottom case with some isopropyl alcohol. After another 20 minutes of scrubbing, the top and bottom cases were about as clean as I could get them with just alcohol, so now it was time to move on to the next phase of cleaning. There were a couple of spots that alcohol just would not clean, so I'm going to move on to baking soda and water for these spots. Then I removed the red LED from the top case so that I could give the two halves one final cleaning in a bath of water and soap. Moving on to the motherboard which looks to be in pretty immaculate condition, there isn't much I can do with it right now other than give it a blast of compressed air as well as test to see that the fuse is good as well as clean the user port and the cassette interface pins. I also used a light brush to remove some of the dust that the compressed air missed. Next I turned my attention to the broken screw standoffs. As you can see this one broke off of the bottom case and is still connected to the motherboard with the screw still in place. And it took some finagling but I was finally able to get it removed with a pair of pliers and a screwdriver. To reattach the standoffs I used a dab of super glue and then I used a pair of pliers to fit them back into place. I'm hoping this is going to be a temporary fix. I want to get a repair kit with brand new screw standoffs because the ones that are on the bottom case are starting to crack and these aren't going to hold up for much longer. Earlier I had noticed that the top case also had a broken screw standoff so here I am fixing that as well. I also added some super glue to the outside to give it more durability. Moving on to the keyboard, I first tried removing the keys, but I found out quickly that I was not prepared for this. I don't have a fancy key puller, so I first tried to pull them off with my bare hands and a screwdriver, but after that proved to be futile, I moved on to MacGyvering myself a key puller out of zip ties. Even still, the keys put up quite a fight, and it took about 20 minutes, but I was finally able to remove all of the keys without damaging anything. And although underneath the keys was pretty dirty, it was honestly better than I was expecting with only a little bit of hair and some crumbs. So after some vacuuming and compressed air, I cleaned the rest of the keyboard off with some alcohol. And as you can see, the keyboard is much cleaner now. Rather than bulk clean the keycaps, I instead opted to individually clean them with a paper towel and some rubbing alcohol. At this point, the entire computer had at least been cosmetically restored. However, I was still waiting for some items to be delivered so that I could actually troubleshoot the functionality of the Commodore 64. So in the meantime, I just reassembled it to see how it looks now that it is completely cleaned. 
Moving on to testing the Commodore 64, this is the original power brick that came with this machine. And a big issue that you have to look out for with old Commodore computers is that their power bricks will go bad over time. And when they do, they can actually fry your Commodore 64 starting with the RAM chips. So rather than deal with the possibility of that happening, I instead opted to buy a modern replacement PSU from eBay. So with the modern PSU replacement delivered, I can now turn on the Commodore 64 to test and see if it's actually working. So I reopened the Commodore 64, and it was at this point that I decided that I will remove the cardboard RF shield. It's a pretty cheaply made shield that a lot of people tend to remove as a way to help keep the chips from overheating inside the computer. And speaking of overheating, I also found this was a good time to add these little RAM sinks to the more important ICs on the motherboard. Although in in retrospect, I probably would have done this after confirming that all of the chips were in fact working. Installing them was pretty easy, they all came with a piece of double-sided thermal tape, so all I had to do was clean off the ICs with some alcohol and then stick them on. Although I would recommend not sticking them in the orientation that I did, I think if I rotated them 90 degrees it would be easier to apply more if I ever wanted to add more to a single chip. So once the RAM sinks were installed, it was time for the moment of truth. I I switched it on and shit it kind of works but the characters are all mismatched and there's that weird strip of different colored characters at the very bottom of the screen part of me was hoping that this was an issue with the character rom however these symptoms were more indicative of an issue with the vic 2 video chip thankfully this was a socketed chip unlike all of the other chips on the motherboard so my first try was to reseed it and see if that made any difference in the image and unfortunately it did not, so my next move was to go out on a limb and actually order a replacement VIC-2 chip online. And here it is after it arrived, the MOS 6567. It is a different revision from the one that was originally on the board, but I don't think that should make any difference. At this point I was pretty nervous, I honestly paid a lot more for this VIC-2 replacement chip than I'm willing to admit. And to be honest, the diagnosis I made of a bad VIC-2 chip was based on a single screenshot I found online on a Commodore 64 diagnosis page. And while I performed a pretty thorough inspection of the motherboard to make sure there weren't any broken traces or things like that, there was still the possibility in my mind that it could have been another chip on the motherboard that was malfunctioning. But in Anyway, time to see if the replacement VIC-2 chip actually paid off. And Jack Trammell must have been smiling down upon me that day because it looks as though I lucked out with the VIC-2 replacement. And so the next order of business was to make sure this new VIC-2 would not die on me by adding not one, not five, but four RAM sinks. Once that was completed, all that was left to do was to reassemble the computer. And now for some before and after shots. If you're wondering what I did with the aftermarket keyboard cover, I did clean it up a little bit. However, I have a much more in-depth project planned for it that I'll definitely be updating about in another video. I also got this cool little keyboard program on a cartridge to test the SID chip, which seems to be working just fine. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this restore project. I'm also happy to finally have a Commodore 64 in my collection, and I can't wait to do more with this computer. Like I said, I kind of want to use it as a synthesizer for music projects, so I definitely want to do the dual SID chip mod down the road. And I'd also like to see if I can use that keyboard cover as a platform to mount things like an external display or various knobs and switches for synthesizer effects and whatnot. But Anyway, I hope you found this video to be entertaining or at least useful in some way, and as always, have a nice day.